Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Timothy Lee, and I'm a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities. I am delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on battery metals today. We will hear from Trent Mell, CEO of Electra Battery Materials. During today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook. Uh, then we will take questions. Uh, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we will get to as many as we can. Before we kick things off, first we need to discuss the fine print during this Electra Battery Metals webinar. Forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined on page two of the Electra corporate presentation, and that can be found on the company's website, electrabmc.com. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors and participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures pertaining to Electra. So we have Electra presenting today. Electra is a unique story in the market uh, as they're focused on creating the only battery metals park in North America. From refining to precursor material, the company's ticker is ELBM on both the TSX Venture Exchange and the NASDAQ. With that, I now turn it over to Trent to update our audience on the company. Thanks for the introduction, Tim. Thanks everybody for, uh, for joining. Um, Electra Battery Materials, for those of you who have been following, used to be known as First Cobalt. So I'll, I'll go through just a, a brief overview of, the, of who we are and maybe who we aren't with the advent of some time. And uh, as Tim pointed out, we do have the fine print here that basically states we will be making forward-looking statements as part of our presentation today. So a bit about the company, we've been at this for you know, kind of five, six years now. Um, the strategy hasn't changed, but the focus has. We, we initially started as first cobalt trying to find uh, cobalt materials for effectively the onshoring of the supply chain in, in today's parlance. We are ahead of the curve then, and I think we're a little bit ahead of the curve again, again today, but um, through our transactions and our works, we landed on this refinery that you see here. This has become the core piece of our of our strategy, and it's taken us from a mineral explorer to a refiner, which is a, a gaping hole in the North American supply chain. And it's no longer just about cobalt. It's about processing any cathode material, so nickel, cobalt, manganese, as well as battery recycling. And so that's the story of Electra. This asset is located about a five-hour drive north of Toronto previously operated. So we've got permits, great community support, and all the land that you see in this picture more or less is owned or or, or could be owned by Electra if we needed it. So about 600 acres of land uh, or more available to us all on a hydroelectric uh, power supplied uh, uh, site, making us, we believe, uh, what will be the, uh, the cleanest and one of the cleanest refiners going forward of battery materials. And so the strategy basically for us is, is initially it's two prong, it's multi prong, but but it's it's getting a cobalt battery grade cobalt product made here in North America so that we're not reliant on China and other foreign sources. Um, as you'll see, the, the cobalt project is is very ambitious, uh, and while well underway, it's going to require a little bit more capital. And so the market that is actionable today, addressable today, is that of battery recycling. We've had a a great amount of success with our recycling plan, and that's going to become the the first phase rather than second phase of our, our our march towards cash flow. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Thereafter, we do have plans for nickel and perhaps manganese as well, and there are talks with OEMs and battery makers around how we could play a part of that, be a part of that solution, given that we're you know, some two hours away from Sudbury and the Sudbury Nickel Basin, um, and, and, and perhaps manganese as well, all with the idea of creating a, a center of excellence, much like Bacon Core in Quebec, uh, where you've got all the refined materials to support precursor manufacturing. Uh, Big Concord is also in our plans. I'll finish a little bit on that. And we still do have a fabulous uh, deposit in, in the Idaho Cobalt Belt. It's a cobalt copper project, arguably non-core to our strategy as a refiner. Um, a lot of value to be had there and, and probably an opportunity to create value for shareholders somewhere down the line as we seek to partner or monetize that asset. So um, let's move on a little bit here and talk a little bit about our, our recent developments so with, uh, with Red Cloud's help, uh, we recently completed a 21 and a half million, this is Canadian dollars, uh, financing in the month of August. Ne challenging, but necessary. I mean, we were, we were delighted with the uptake um, of the offering. Uh, overall allotment was filled in full. 
40 or so different investors. And I say challenging just because the markets are choppy. So delighted by the uptake, tough market conditions upon which to have executed on that. But um, with the the road that I see ahead of us in terms of future sources of capital, namely strategic partners and government sources, um, I think those who got in at that raise and those who got in thereafter are going to be rewarded. Uh, myself and another insider, and maybe more, were in the market today buying shares. So I think that underscores the, the confidence that we have in our story. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the updated economics for both the refinery and the black mass recycling and why we've shuffled the priorities around. We're moving both forward, but black mass is uh, is the one that we'll see first into, uh, into production given our recent successes. Um, and that really it follows on the heels of a very successful plant scale recycling uh, demonstration plant that we've been operating since December of last year. Uh, three fires, uh, again, if you followed us, you, you, you've read a little bit about three fires. We've got a couple of different prongs to that relationship. On the one hand, um, working with them on an MOU to do the battery shredding. There's a couple of battery plants coming to Ontario. There's end of life batteries as well that are gonna have to be recycled. Uh, our, our role up at our refinery is gonna be to, to refine the black mass into its various constituent elements. But before you can do that, you need to take the batteries and shred them. And there are a lot of shredders in the US, not so in Canada. And by partnering with three fires, we think we can, outside of the Electra proper and build a business model that will provide all the feed that we need uh, for the refining operations. And then most recently, we uh, partnered uh, yet again with LG Energy Solutions. So LG is the second largest battery manufacturer in the world. And maybe more importantly, they're the biggest non-Chinese um, battery company in the world. And so we initially had a contract with them. We've extended that, expanded the scope and the term, and they continue to be a really important uh, client for us in the go forward. So the one macro slide I want to put up is, is this one here, the onshoring opportunity and our transition from a mineral exploration company to a refining company can really be explained by this chart. And you see the blue portion of the various uh, products, the nickel, manganese, the cobalt, as well as the cell manufacturing. That's the, the China the control, China dominance uh, on the supply chain and, and why we need to onshore this part of the supply chain. And so um, North American OEMs, as they set up their manufacturing plants, as they set up their cell plants, their battery plants, um, you do need to bring the rest of that supply along because all of the resources that we aspire to develop in North America and Canada and the US um, can't be developed or at least can't be developed for this market if you don't have the what we call the midstream. And so it goes from the mine, the mine and mill, then it comes to our refinery and from the refinery, it goes to a precursor and a cathode active materials facility before then finally making its way to the battery plants that we're seeing across uh, Southern Ontario and, and across the US. And that's the part that's, I guess, gotten, gotten the attention of a lot of policymakers in Canada and the US. The Inflation Reduction Act in the US is also um, helpful in that regard. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. All right, so I'm gonna start, when I talk about the refinery project, there's the property itself, but also the initial uh, starting point, which was really taking the, the legacy asset that you saw on the front page and making it into a battery grade cobalt uh, producer. And so here's the inside of the plant. Um, and, and I think the big takeaway here is, you know, you can see the lights are on. If you were in there, you'd hear the machines, you'd hear the pumps and motors, and you'd see that this plant is actually operating, in this case, running black mass through the plant. And so this is not a, you know, we're not a, a PowerPoint company uh, and we're not purely a developing company. We've got a, a big part of our asset, and you'll, you'll see more pictures here in a bit, um, that has operated, that has its permits. We've got an operating team and um, it's given us a really important head start, both in the permitting, uh, the knowledge base, the testing, as well as our ramp up, uh, no matter what product we, we intend to process. And so replacement value of what we acquired back in late 2017, is north of 100 million dollars we put about another 80 million again in canadian dollars into the refinery project over the last year and a half two years and on the heels of that we've expanded our lg contract as i uh, as i alluded to um, sustainability huge part of what we're doing anything and everything we do here has to be and will be uh lower carbon footprint than our chinese and, and frankly most of our asian peers it's not hard with the grid we have but that carries through in everything we do and uh, as you'll see, when it comes to this plant and the recycling piece, Three Fires stands to uh, be an important partner for us on, on a go forward basis. So this is again, a bigger version of the picture you saw on the first page. So this is what we acquired back in 2017, uh, commissioned in 1996, operated on and off until about 2012, produced nickel and cobalt in a carbonate form. So that wouldn't be battery grade. 
but it does have an operating history. You can see the warehouse out the back, the tailings, pretty small tailings facility relative to a mining operation. And then if I come forward a little bit, you can see what it looks like today or last December, it's a little dated. So here you'll see the, the legacy refinery and the warehouse right here. Back here, this is the, the um, uh, sorry, the crystallizer piece that makes the final product. And so the product basically runs through our refinery, makes its way here. This is a big solvent extraction facility to make the pure battery grade cobalt. Then it would come back into this plant and we would make the battery grade cobalt for final production, final sort of final market. And then we bag it in this warehouse here that has since been completed. So forget all my, my little markings there, but that gives you an, an idea what the, what the property looks like as of today. And then here's an aerial view. It just gives you a sense of the different buildings. And so when you look at this, and I mentioned multi-prong, nickel, maybe manganese, certainly cobalt and recycling. Uh, an important takeaway, this is an integrated site. And so if you want to look at, uh, on the one hand, you know, obviously the lab, lab and assay, that applies to everything. Our water lines, our permits, you know, a lot of the things that we've installed here for the, ostensibly for the cobalt plant applies to matter what, no matter what we're going to be doing. Oh, I can see if I can clear that here. Hold on. There we go. Okay, so where we landed, our, a lot of our engineering work, studies, permitting were done uh, in the COVID lockdown. And it's a very unconventional way to build a, or to design a greenfield slash brownfield operation. We had Asenko, our owner's team, and a few other contractors working in their living rooms and sometimes at site to try to you know, figure out how we were gonna execute on this. And it, it worked out quite well. Uh, we have a very strong team at a Sudbury, our own team, uh, Mark Trevisiel, our VP projects. We now have uh, Dave Marshall as well, VP engineering. Um, interestingly, one's from Glencore, one's from Valley. And if you know Sudbury, you know, the two often don't cross over, but we've got a nice healthy balance of Valley, uh, Glencore and, and share it folks within our company and that served us very well in terms of the knowledge base we tried to build up. So coming out of COVID, um, did some, our, our initial raise, uh, convertible debt, equity, government support. And then we started on our, on our execution. And um, those of you following projects through 2022 and from Electra right through to GM, um, you know, inflation, supply chain disruption, delays, it was uh, endemic of just about any industry, microchips and in cars, microchips at our plant, uh, steel, whether it's again for the automotive industry or for our plant, you know, we, we, we took a lot of hits. Uh, our freight, I think actualized was about seven times higher than our estimate in our scoping study. And that's the buildup you see here. So, we did a rebase line from our construction project budget of 104 million Canadian to where we see it going now that we've got most of our long lead equipment uh, locked down, ordered or almost at site. And the average, you know, the high low 155 to 167, call it $161 million from 104 is about 40% higher than what was initially projected. So in line with the industry, but you know, frankly, who cares when you're pre-cash flow and you're a small company, these things are, are more impactful and you can't just sort of sweep them under the rug. And so armed with this um, back in Q1, we took the decision to slow things down. Um, and we were blessed, however, with results of a very successful black mass study. And so to pause for a second, black mass, what is it? Spent batteries. So these would be lithium ion batteries. It could be in your laptop or power tools or electric vehicles or maybe hybrids at this point, as well as battery scrap coming out of factories valuable materials, lithium, nickel, cobalt, as well as manganese, uh, graphite, maybe some copper. Those are the things that the industry wants to recover. And so with our team and the inside of the building that you saw earlier, we acquired black mass from partners in the US. We've got about 20 partners around the world willing to sell us black mass. Um, they take the, the batteries in, they shred them. So you remove the plastic casings and the, the aluminum foil and then you crush the anode and cathode into a black powder. You'll see a picture of it. And, and, and then, then you got to process it. Then you got to uh, take all of the individual constituent elements out of it. And today in North America, 90% of that black mass goes to Glencore Smelter in Sudbury and the remaining by and large goes to Asia. So there are no hydrometallurgical refineries uh, commercialized. Glencore is just a smelter. And so graphite doesn't get recovered. Lithium doesn't get recovered. And so we're not yet at a mature state. Some of our bigger peers, Lifecycle and Redwood, are looking to build out large scale refineries. We were the first to do it on a on a plant scale, uh, you know, smaller, but albeit plant scale and demonstrate our own uh, proprietary flow sheet. And so with the 
plant that you saw, uh, if we go from a, from a demonstration plant, which is a batch process, to a continual operation and debottleneck some of the circuits, namely the lithium circuit, which is a, a new installation that wasn't there uh, as part of the legacy plant, we're, we're looking at about an $8 million, as it's plus minus 50% on a desktop study, but call it an $8 million spend in contrast to the 80 million we need to complete our cobalt plant. And you can see the paybacks pretty quick, a year, year, maybe two. And so running 2,500 tons of black mass through our plant, we've got an EBITDA projection of, you know, call it 10, $11 million per annum. Now that's a quarter of what, I mean, less than a quarter of what we would ultimately expect to generate from the cobalt plant. Um, but it's just a logical way to proceed in terms of our ability to deploy this capital, get ourselves to cash flow, get the re-rate off of that, get our operator credibility, and then continue on with our cobalt plant with the flow of funds that I anticipate from strategic partners and government entities. So recycling, here's, a, here's actually a good picture of the black mass right there. So this is what comes in. And, and so when you look at our circuit, I didn't talk about it earlier, but ours is a, because it's a hydromet circuit, everything's coming in in this kind of a, a semi-processed intermediate uh, basis. So it's a, it's a leach process followed by solvent extraction. And then you can crystallize it or not, depending whether you've got a precursor manufacturer right next door to you. And so hydrometallurgy is not, not new or novel, but when it comes to black mass and you're targeting five or six different elements, we've all got a slightly different recipe with reagents and residence times and, and flows uh, that we're keeping fairly guarded, whether it be us or some of our peers. Um, so I don't know, is anything in here I haven't talked about? I mean, the second line tells you what it is we're targeting, right? All the different products. The big payables in a, in a black mass is nickel, cobalt, and lithium. Uh, when we started on our, our flow sheet with SGS, before we had our own lab operating uh, up at site, we were using SGS, mostly targeting the, the, the nickel and cobalt. And then lithium had a crazy run, 2021, 2022. Uh, it became uh, almost equal value to the nickel plus cobalt. And that's been a real big focus of ours as we ran our demonstration plant. So commissioned the plant in December. And with each batch, we were able to, again, tweak, adjust, modify, test all the streams and get smarter and smarter as we went. That's the beauty, beauty of a plant scale operation is you can run things on a bulk basis and, and learn things you wouldn't find in a lab scale environment. And with the lab there, we're able to get results back in real time. All right, so, and, and the, you know, the products, as you'll see in a second, we don't need, and this is part of our, I think our secret to our success, we don't need to kind of boil the ocean. We don't need to take black mass and, and make everything back into a battery grade state. Uh, that would take a, an entire campus and, and a lot of money. Our, our, our point is to take the black mass, split them up into saleable products and sell them off. So an MHP, uh, a cobalt rich nickel product that can go to a smelter and into the metal market for today, it pays the bills, it makes money. And in time, as we build our cobalt plant, we'll be able to split off the cobalt stream and make a cobalt sulfate. But we don't need to do that to get ourselves into cash flow. We just need to make sure we're making good, good return on investment. And with time, the beneficiation of our products will get better and better. Lithium, same thing. A lithium carbonate that we're producing um, may not be commercial grade out of the gate, but we've got enough lithium converters, partners, big players you would know that would buy our product for, from us. And we would earn a margin on that based on our, our lower capex uh, capital intensity. Um, critical, yeah, I mean, the, the success factors at trial, I think just demonstrating the process works and then forever increasing our recovery rates. And for those of you in the mining industry, you know, in the gold sector, for instance, a, a gold mill is always, you know, you're always tweaking. And we, my experience, you're always tweaking that mill to improve your recoveries, lower your operating costs because it's free money. It, it just goes right to your bottom line. And so that's been a big part of the last two or three months. We haven't declared that our black mass trial is over because we still got ideas and continuous improvement opportunities that we're targeting as we move forward to build out a, a permanent installation. Here you can see a picture of our, of our, of our lithium carbonate. Uh, it is a bottleneck because it is a relatively small circuit. And so that's in addition to improving our process um, and then getting a, a dryer for our graphite product, um, we, we need a bigger install for the lithium carbonate because that is slowing up the batch process, uh, just given the equipment we're using for our installation. But that's, you know, that's, that's life of a demonstration plant. Uh, live and learn, some deliberate decisions, some inadvertent ones, and you, you, know, you build your final plant around that. But I think the biggest satisfaction we had for our team, and I give Mark Trevisiel credit, he did recycling at Glencore many, many years ago, um, but the recovery rates that we were getting in a plant setting were actually better than what we were seeing in the lab in many instances. And that, 
often is not the case because you have unintended effects or unforeseen consequences sometimes of running things on a on a larger scale process. And our team has done a really, really good job of following everything closely, understanding what's going on. And I'll, I'll give George, we've had a call out as well on that. Um, and those results we've seen have been encouraging to us and also to our partners. We've had, uh, gosh, uh, maybe 10 different supply chain partners, um, a lot of Asian counterparties, big companies that you would know have gone through our plant trying to understand if we could be a partner for their um, for their batteries, uh, we get called regularly with scrap market material that they want to quietly dispose of. The, the issue we have right now is we don't yet have the shredder. So we can take the black mass, but it has to be shredded for now, at least it has to be shredded somewhere else. But lots of interest um, and, it, you know, the good building blocks for, for what we're trying to accomplish over the next 12 months. Here's a picture of the MHP. Um, because our targeted black mass was lco batteries so lithium cobalt oxide the, the consumer electronic type batteries cobalt content is higher than in the current generation electric vehicle batteries and so the cobalt in the mhp that we produce is of a very high value uh, relative to run of grade mhp more importantly nobody in north america has made an mhp so it's a it's a nice marketable product it's a market that's growing uh, but this is a product as i alluded to earlier we're going to be able to take this further downstream the cobalt could be could be streamed off and either plated or made into a sulfate. Uh, but for now, this is where we're going to start as we commercialize our, 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 our plant. And as a cobalt plant gets built thereafter, we'll have more opportunities to uh, just kind of goose the margins on our, on our flow sheet here. So next steps for us, having completed the financing um, that, that we have done, I, I would say we don't yet have all the capital to commercialize, uh, to commission the, the recycling plant, but we're, I think we will. I think we will by the end of the year. But right now, what we need to do is emit some model of material balance. We need to understand based on our, our flows and the trial results, whether our modeled expectations on equipment sizing of tanks, et cetera, is, is in line and, and what needs to be adjusted. And then just getting the basic engineering in place and the process flows and getting a handle on what the long lead equipment will be and so forth. So there'll be a summary report on the, on the trial that we are still doing, but more or less completed. And there'll also be an update to our scoping study. About, you know, I don't know if it's a fell one, two, three, we'll see what kind of engineering report we, we land on. But given that it's a Brownfields uh, site that has operated, uh, a lot of this work can be handled internally. All right, okay, some uh, outlook now and sort of strategic developments. I want to start with LG. Um, talked to them uh, already, talked about them as, as being the, the largest counterparty we could have. They supply at least a half dozen OEMs that are interested in working with us. And so when you work on the commercial side, some of these relationships we've been working on for years. Uh, in the case of LG, they've got a very clear sighted view on what they want to accomplish in North America. They're deploying a lot of capital and they are more aggressive than most of their counterparties in terms of their North American investment onshoring strategy. And, and what's nice with counterparties like this is it doesn't stop with one transaction, right? There is a vision for what they want to do. There is a vision for all the things that Electra could do with them for them. And so I view this cobalt agreement and the relationship on a personal and professional level with the individuals there as, as, a, as a building block and, and with, with more to come. And so initially last fall, we signed a contract for three years of supply and 7,000 tons of cobalt. Three years became five and 7,000 became 19,000 tons of cobalt. And so that's, yeah, I'd like to think a testament to our own progress, but but, but also interestingly, this contract extension or expansion followed our decision that we were you know, gonna prioritize black mass and delay cobalt by a year. And so the, the takeaway there is that you know, LG doesn't care. They don't really need the cobalt in 2024. The, the onshoring becomes relevant in North America in 2025, 2026, 2027, as these battery plants get up and running. And so for them, it was really about locking down supplies because under the Inflation Reduction Act, um, North American or free trade country content in your batteries and EVs is critical to determine eligibility for the $7,500 vehicle credit in the U.S. And the domestic content or free trade content just goes up over time. And so by locking up 80% of our production uh, over this term, it's created a, you know, fortunately, I guess a bit of a, a bidding war, a contest for the remaining 20% of our output. We've also got line of sight to take our cobalt refinery, which is currently slated to have a nameplate of 5,000 tons, we can take that up to 6,500 tons per year. 
uh, with about a five, six, seven million dollar investment that will increase the amount of cobalt that we can put under contract. But before we do any of that, uh, we need to address you know, the capital solution, the funding gap that we've got. And so I, I'm, I'm seeing opportunities on both sides of the border from government agencies, whether it be federal, provincial, U.S., and I'm seeing opportunities in the supply chain to, to bring that capital forward. Um, and so that's going to be a big focus of mine and the commercial team from here at the end of the year is identifying the final pieces of capital to get ourselves into production on the cobalt plant while we move forward with our recycling. So three fires, um, you talked about them already. Um, I didn't explain who they are. I mean, they're basically a, an economic development arm of First Nations in Southern Ontario. And so their traditional land encompasses uh, some of the new battery plants that have been announced in Canada. And uh, they've done some ambitious and, and creative dealings already, whether it be energy transition, they're looking at a you know, deep sea port. They worked with one of the big um, conglomerates here in Canada, which I, I won't name, but it's a really um, intelligent group, uh, ambitious, and they've been a real pleasure to work with. And so there were two parts. One is let's work on building the shredder in Southern Ontario that can supply the black mass to the refinery. And then thereafter, they said, we'd like to make a strategic investment into Electra of $10 million and, and, and help transform Electra into a, a better, more accessible indigenous platform for participation in supply chain. And so the focus now is really on the JV, the investment. Uh, we couldn't pull it together before closing our, our financing a few weeks ago. So we parked that for now, and hopefully we can come back to that uh, before too long. But um, I think there's a lot of work we got to do right now to get that first step on and off the ground now that we've got our, our financing done. And that really is going to be the focus of the next few weeks um, and probably a couple of months. This map, great illustration. Uh, first off, I will say you can see Temiskaming Shores, the, the orange dot uh, just north of Toronto near Sudbury. Uh, a lot of people think that we're in the far north. Uh, clearly, we are not. We're near Sudbury. We're near Timmins. We're in a great mining corridor and we're on the doorstep of not just the two battery plants you see in southern Ontario, but everything else across America. There's more than a dozen of plants uh, under construction. And so the opportunity with three fires, though, is having you know, VW, for instance, on the traditional territory of one of their members. It's a it's a logical working relationship. Uh, and moreover, for First Nations to work, if you're going to work in the energy transition and battery supply chain, you know, recycling um, is an obvious place to start. There, it's, it's not a contentious uh, topic, uh, whereas there are differing views on mineral extraction, primary extraction. Recycling is a is a is an easy win, if you will, and I'm I'm hopeful we can we can uh, formulate a win-win-win approach for for industry for us and for three fires. And look forward to giving you more updates on that in the next couple of couple of quarters. Uh, Bekakur, I I only mentioned this earlier. So so Bekakur for for uh, the uninitiated, I guess it's a it's an industrial brownfield site located north of Montreal, south of Quebec City, on the St. Lawrence River. So it's got a deep water port aluminum uh, production historically and it's got all the services so water and gas and industrial dump and so forth and so you've got right now three investment Quebec's done a fabulous job of developing this three different cathode plants that are uh, that have been announced one under development right now is GM with POSCO the second one BASF and then just last week Ford and EcoPro announced that and so you know in order to build their 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 cathode plant they're going to need PCAM and the PCAM needs refined materials and so to date, we've got Valet uh, building a uh, nickel refinery uh, on the camp, small nickel dissolution. Euromanganese is going to be ostensibly, at least they've completed the study. They want to do the, the manganese component. And we were invited in to Bacon Core to be the cobalt uh, solution provider for one, two, or hopefully all three of them. Um, and, and the opportunity here when it comes to Investment Quebec is they partner with the federal government. And the funding opportunity for us is about 30 to 50% of the CapEx being covered in some fashion from the two levels of government. And so I mentioned earlier, we were early adopters in Ontario. A lot of the programs, funding programs didn't exist when we started. So if we can get that first one off and running, then we can turn our attention to a second facility, which will have a much lower hurdle rate to a construction decision, given the availability of capital that's there now. So near-term milestones are coming to a close here and we can open it up to questions. Um, I mentioned the, the summary report. I, I think that the black mass trial, we've, we've learned a ton. And so we're going to share some of that with the market and, and give a give folks a better appreciation for the kind of products and margin opportunities that we see. Um, and, and with that, also a, a, an appreciation of our timeline to develop that asset. Um, I think I've said in the past 12 months, and 
once we have final capital in place, I'd say we don't quite have final capital in place, but hopefully we can address that shortly. Uh, and then meanwhile, um, we still have a lot of lead equipment, long lead equipment being delivered to site for the Cobalt facility. And the value in that is when we do resume construction, there is you know, some instrumentation and piping equipment that needs to be purchased. But a lot of the sort of either custom or long lead items that we've been waiting on for a year and a half, um, including microchips um, for the uh, control room, um, have been received or are being received. And so it de-risks both the capital timeline, capital cost rather, and the timeline for completion of our asset once we uh, once we resume in earnest the uh, construction of the cobalt plant. And then I won't say too much about government funding decisions, but they're there. And I, I, I've alluded to them. I've alluded to streams that are available in the U.S. Um, and, and there are some streams, both federally and provincially, that are available to us as well. And so that 80 million Canadian of of uh, uh, of capital remaining, um, I don't know if we'll get half of it from government. It's, I think it's a possibility, but but certainly a big, you're going to get close to it. I, I mean, I'm soft circling. So let's say anywhere from 20 to 40 million, I think, could come from these three levels of government. And I'm sort of leaning towards the, the larger end of things. And then I'll be looking to industry to help break the back of the residual amounts. Um, again, more to, no promises on any of that, but that's kind of what I'm working towards. And we'll have more news, I would think, before the end of the year on a bunch of these uh, bunch of these streams. Um, and this just just a bit of a recap. So, you know, the cobalt facility, 5,000 tons with a carbon footprint that exceeds any other cobalt plant in the world. Um, a first, maybe permanent and, and potentially vertically integrated cobalt, or sorry, battery recycling um, supply chain in Canada as well. Um, and then and then onward and upward from there, you know, Concord, Nickel and so forth. But partners like LG and, and perhaps one other that we'll be able to announce in the coming months uh, are going to be key to our success and key partners to help us uh, build out going forward. So with that, I think that really ends my formal presentation. Happy to go to questions from your side. Or, Great. Sorry, Thank you, Trent, uh, for a very informative presentation. Uh, we'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. Just a reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box. Uh, we already do have several questions. Um, first, I'm not sure how to phrase this exactly, but um, can you explain the, uh, the the plans to build multiple refineries even before one refinery is, is uh, completed in producing? Yeah, fair question. You don't, I guess, is the that's the bottom line, right? You, we we got to get the cash flow, and so the, I mean, the Bay Concours, one of the OEMs I talked to there said, look, we we don't we don't necessarily need you until 2026, 2027, right? So we do have a bit of we do have a bit of time. The decision to prioritize recycling is that we are seeing an active market, an existing market today at both black mass feed and people willing to take the offtake from us. Again, low capital intensity. So you got to stage them. And so to stage it, it's going to be battery recycling first, Ontario cobalt refining second, and then Quebec comes into play. You know, you've got that expansion in Ontario. So you might, depending how we structure things with our partners, we could conceivably expand the Ontario plant before building on a Bay Concours. Bay Concours gives you the, so Bay Concours third. Um, and then you come back and you start thinking about nickel, which is a massive project, would be government, industry, Electra, um, and that's a few years out. The interesting thing with Bay Concours is once we built this plant out, this plant is taking in a cobalt hydroxide feedstock out of the DRC. Um, same as Yumacore, same as China. This is where battery grade materials come from, sourcing, ethical considerations. I think the industry spent the last five years, it's almost like blood diamonds, right? Kind of figuring that out, supply chain and, and whatnot. So put, putting that aside for a moment, you go now to Quebec, the opportunity there might be metal dissolution. So you've got another market you could tap, small footprint, low capex, different product stream, and you could supplement and kind of play both ends of the market. Similarly on the downstream, you're making cobalt sulfate, a little bit of plating uh, investment, you could also make a, make an alloy product to the alloy market. And so we are looking at that optionality is huge for a plant like this, right? Products in, products out. If you can play with that, it's a trader's dream. And so these are kind of some of the things you start thinking of when you look at a, a second facility somewhere else. And even the U.S. I mean, the sorry, I'm, I'm long-winded here uh, on, on the response, Tim, but I, I haven't lost sight of the vast amounts of money, $369 billion of money available in the U.S. So yes, Bay Concord, but what about the U.S., right? What about Georgia or Louisiana or Carolinas? Should we, could we be doing something down there? Absolutely. And, and so, you know, we got to get our sea legs and that's, that's 
black mass refining. But there's a, there's a lot we can do in part because nobody else is doing this. Uh, we're in a, a class of one, we're tiny, but with our partners, I think we'll be able to look at different options as we you know, get the cash flow and, and, and earn our, our operating stripes. Great. Um, now we do have a few questions along a similar line here, um, but I guess first actually to, to reiterate, you did have a slide on this, um, but uh, how do you justify the capital increases uh, to the plant? Yeah, the, I mean, look, part of it, and, and we're, I think we've done a bit of this in our, in our disclosure. Some of it was just uh, detailed engineering, some, some, some flow sheet modifications, ongoing met testing. So some of that, I suppose you could say is kind of on us, right? We had 80% detailed engineering instead of 98 or wherever we are today. So some scope kind of comes into that. We also made improvements to our flow sheet. We made a deliberate decision to buy a larger crystallizer so that we can go from 5,000 to 6,500. So that introduced new capital. But a lot of it, as I said, a lot of it has to do with just the crazy inflationary world we were in. I mean, the, the example I gave of freight being seven times higher, same with same with steel, same with concrete, labor went up, all the trades went up. And and I do know in Bay Concours, same thing, like we're not, uh, it's it's awful, but we're, we're not in a class of one here. We are the norm, 40%, 50% project increase sounds, sounds incredible, but let's not forget that we just lived the highest inflationary period that we've seen in 40 plus years. And for those of you in my city of Toronto, if you look at the infrastructure projects we're doing here on, on rail and subway expansions, you know, it's the same thing. Although I hate to compare myself to the public service. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a disgusting reality we all got to live with. But again, a small company like us, you really do take it on the chin. And so what that means on a go forward, this rebase line was huge for us because it's a little bit of the postmortem right on some of the deliberate changes, some of the inadvertent. Um, but where we got ourselves to with all the long lead equipment on site, SX tanks, if you took a tour of some of those filled facilities, you'll see a lot of equipment, some of it installed, some of it not. And so the remaining 80 million of CapEx, a lot of it is going to be putting everything together. Yes, piping and electrical and, and whatnot has to be done in some purchases. But I think the, the, the risk profile going forward has been significantly reduced by virtue of a bunch of things that we've done. Great. Um, and along those lines, we had a few questions actually about uh, plans for uh, financing of mm -hmm. that uh, remaining CapEx. Uh, what steps um, would Electra undertake to secure funding to complete the refinery? And so I did walk through that a little bit. Um, I would hope that the next two announcements we make uh, would be in the nature of non-dilutive, non-equity financing. So we've got debt, we did an equity raise. Again, I was in the market today buying buying a little bit of shares and so with Michael, our VP commercial. Um, I, think, I think government's gonna figure more prominently in the shorter term. And then I would hope, expect that industry then follows on the heels of that. And so of the remaining capital that's left, the majority of that I will expect uh, to be uh, taken up by government and industry sources. Um, and, and if there is a, a need for additional capital, then that would be the equity. But I don't want to be running back to the equity market every few months. It's, a, it's, been, it's been tough on, on us shareholders, and I would hope that we don't have to do that for some time yet. Sure. And then a question here, how contingent is the recommissioning of the cobalt refinery on funding the remaining, uh, the remaining 80 million of CapEx? Yeah, look, I think, I think um, if I understand that question, I think the, the idea is to go for the low capital battery recycling, right? I think, I think, I think by, by moving forward with black mass and by, not just showing off, by, by basically commercializing what my, my team has managed to accomplish in a, in a black mass refining sort of process, proprietary process. It, it does give us the time, the breathing room to execute on what I just said, right? getting government and industry participation um, up until that door was open to us, the recycling door was open to us. It really was a race to the finish, right? You had to go and find the capital, whether it be convertible debt or equity and, and government doesn't move at the same speed as the capital markets. Uh, I will say on the industry side as well, 2020, what are we, 2023, there, there was a cooling at the beginning of the year. All this talk of strategic investments that we've been having with a number of partners took a bit of a pause with strains on big global corporate balance sheets. They're overextended on capital spend expenditures 
earnings are down, margins are down, rates are up. And so a lot of the interest um, was paused, I think I would say. Um, but we can take a more patient approach, a more deliberate approach and be very clear that we're not building it until we've got the funding solution in place. And so it puts us in a much stronger position than we were in even six months ago. Great. Um, and kind of a follow up question, how much time after financing is obtained would the cobalt refinery start producing the core uh, cobalt sulfate product? Yeah, so we're looking at about 12 months, 12 months financing to construction. And that was fairly well laid out in our in our rescoping or for our rebase line uh, exercise. Um, and I don't see, if it's possible, I don't see anything in the remaining equipment that could or would throw that off. And then once you commission, what's the ramp up curve? And so in the case of Black Mass, given that we've operated it um, on, on a fairly large scale, you know, we're looking at a handful of months, three to five months, we think we can commercializing 2,500 tons is not the same as, uh, as 5,000 tons of, of flow. Um, when you get to the cobalt plant, we're looking at a ramp up curve of about 12 months. So 12 months to build, 12 months to fully commission. And the way these curves kind of work is your first 20%, so your first few months, really you're focused on getting the quality of the product in. And then when you go from 20% to 80%, that's a pretty quick ramp up. And then that last little bit to get from 80 to 100 and beyond, um, that would take a little bit longer. And I, I will say beyond, this is an important uh, opportunity that, that is top of mind for all of us. You know, plants like this, as you start to get your operational knowledge up and efficiencies and understand flows and capacity of some of these tanks, um, it's certainly not unheard of for, for nameplate to be exceeded, sometimes by a good margin. And so that might be an opportunity further down the line as we get this plant up to 5,000. And before we expand, 5,000 could, could be something a little better than that. Right. Now, this question kind of overlaps a bit uh, with the previous, but obviously the proceeds of the, the 21 and a half million just raised, how much would be slated to go toward the black mass recycling uh, work versus mm -hmm. how much, uh, you know, obviously needing to raise capital for the, for the cobalt uh, sulfate? Yeah, I, I would say the splits probably, I would say 70% of it's probably going towards the cobalt plant to get the remaining supplies in, right? Get that equipment, get it to site. Um, and then the residual is uh, is towards the black mass. Now, a lot of the, the initial work we've got to do on black mass is our own technical team, our own engineers and metallurgists and a little bit of help from EXP and, and Hatch. Um, but yeah, a lot of this is just making sure that the cobalt plant, and it's not, look, it's not going to stop. We're not, we're not at a standstill, but a lot of the packages that we've received and a lot of the works that we're going to be doing, we've got a bag breaker, for instance, of the material that comes in has to run through a conveyor and then the material is basically cut from underneath so that these big white super sacks can drop the material into the conveyor. A package like that is something we can install ourselves. So there'll be a bit of that going on in the background as we move forward on the black mass as well. Some of these applications, as I alluded to earlier, are, are mutually beneficial anyway. They support both projects. Great. Um, one question here, uh, further to the LG announcements, what other companies are being courted for the remaining 20% uh, and when will these contracts be finalized and announced? So obviously I can't say that I'm under NDA. However, um, what can I say? Michael and I are going back to Asia. We do, I do an annual trip. He does a twice annual trip to meet with, meet with our partners there. I would say the Koreans historically have been the most um, aggressive with their investment cycle, but the Japanese and the traditional North American players are quickly catching up. And I think if you follow the headlines of some of the announcements and where people are investing, where companies are investing, um, you, you'll quickly see which companies are prioritizing North America and which are investing maybe more willingly in Asia and other markets. Um, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a non-answer. I would say we've got uh, certainly three very active discussions on the remaining cobalt supplies. Um, and, and there's, you know, some have been going a little bit longer, but I think we, look, we've got to be selfish here and we've got to allocate our, allocate our, our, our asset, which is our capacity to partners that are willing to help us make it successful. And that, that basically comes down to capital and that could take the form of a strategic investment. It could be a prepay against future production. It could be some kind of a corporate loan or loan guarantee. It could be lobby efforts for greater government contributions. I mean, look at 
in Canada now we're playing a little bit of catch up with the IRA. The VW plant, the Stellantis plant combined have about $30 billion of sort of grants and incentives to get them off the ground. Now, my back of the envelope math means that for every job on a job basis, every job created by the VW plant, they're getting about three and a half million dollars of support. Um, for every job we're creating up at our refinery, to date at least, we've received about $83,000 of support. There's a huge gap there that, that has to be addressed. And it may not be at par because the Canadian government's been clear. They're not going to try to match IRA every step of the way. But there's a huge inequity there that I am quietly lobbying, fighting to have addressed. And bringing industry partners along for the ride is helpful because in some cases, in some circles, there's an expectation that, wait a minute, if we're putting money into you, you should be investing in your supply chain. And so lots of lots of discussions. And it goes back to my to my point earlier, Tim, about um, having the luxury of a little bit more time to drill these things down rather than having to grab the first thing that comes your way, uh, which wouldn't necessarily serve the interest of our shareholders. Great. Uh, now I realize we have a couple more questions that have come in on that funding side and kind of reiterating a little, but do you have any funding commitment on the table from government or, or institutions? Um, I, I, I guess I'd say, I, I guess I'd say yes. Uh, but these are informal, um, nothing. Yeah. I mean, these are soft, soft commitments, right? We're talking around numbers. We're talking around funding solutions and I won't say who, what, where, or how much, but yes, these aren't early stage discussions by any stretch. Um, I, I could think of four different conversations that have been going on for some time. And it gives me, again, I won't talk government or industry, gives me a fair measure of confidence that we can get maybe a couple of these announced before the end of the year. Um, and a few different questions here on the NASDAQ listing. Um, so there's been a few times that it's traded below a dollar. Um, is yep. there a risk of, of a delisting or are there plans to, do you intend to keep that NASDAQ listing? Yeah, look, the, I, I don't think so. I, I think, the, I think we've got a, a grace period to bring that up. We're still weathering, you know, what was a big financing in a tough market. And I do think we come back from that. Um, so it's, which is why we're, some of us are buying now, right? I, I think we're in the, the dead of August and we've got a lot of stock to chew through and it was a share and a warrant deal. And so with those kinds of deals, you get the investors I like, which is the long-term support of shareholders. And then you get the people that are there for the, the warrant that are going to trade the shares out. And so that's just the reality of the world we're in. Capital markets, equity markets can be tough and violent and painful. And you just got to bear down and, 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 and get through it. Um, the good news is our liquidity has picked up. And so for those traders that are here for a short time, I think we'll be able to eat through that a little bit further and lift that back up. Now, the NASDAQ listing itself, it's, look, it's not, it's not cheap, right? The NASDAQ is a, it's a, it's a nice step up from the B. There are costs with that. And a lot of it has to do with DNO insurance and regulatory costs. Uh, but the liquidity we've seen there, the, market that it opens to us um, this last financing for instance met with a lot of family offices in the new york area or the northeast uh, funds that would not have met with us or invested uh had we only been listed on the venture exchange and so you know we, we could look to list from the go from the v to the big board um, but the nasdaq has opened up some doors and i think as we march forward and get closer to production and re-rate the stock I, I think that that listing will pay more and more dividends beyond just the liquidity opportunities we see Right. Now, one question here, you did state that you're buying shares in the market and some of this may be, you know, somewhat private information may not be, you may or may not be able to answer, but you've stated that you've taken pay reductions, mm -hmm. how much, yeah. and yeah. you are purchasing shares today, how many? <laughs> yeah, today's, I will say it's modest, but let me back up. I have, and the reason I'm in the market today is because I, there wasn't room for me in this last raise. And so from 2017 until today, I believe I could be wrong, but I believe I participated in every single financing. And so my first year when we were first cobalt, um, I didn't take a salary. I took the equivalent of a year's salary and I invested in shares. Maybe not a great ROI today, but look, at you got to put your money where your mouth is, right? I'm here. I'm collecting a salary. I'm talking about the story of investors are going to believe in it. I've got to invest in that in that as well. And so um, when things got tough, a number of us, myself included, took a 20% pay reduction. 
Um, so, and it was a cash reduction. So it's not, I mean, we didn't lose 20, we gave 20 in one year vesting RSUs. And so we're getting exposure to the equity performance up or down, but it was the right thing to do to save capital. And I would say the majority of the employees participated in that plan and, and others were, were let go, uh, were let go entirely. Now, given the performance we had and, and that we didn't meet expectations, um, nobody in 2023 in the management, the senior leadership team had a salary raise and nobody got a bonus. And so, again, you got to do the right things. And I think when you look at our, and we'll have our circular out here soon, I think what you'll see is that, um, you know, we, we're, we're going we're gonna to walk the talk. We, we underperformed and compensation reflected that this year. Um, now, a couple of questions that might be perhaps take it offline, but there's a question about, uh, do you use, uh, I guess, nitrogen or oxygen gas in your, your recycling process and or, and or in the cobalt sulfate refinery? Nitrogen or oxygen gas. Now there might be a metallurgist who's going to yeah. toss me. I, I don't, I, the answer is I don't know. I mean, look, I think, I think when you're looking at black mass, and making it into an MHP, one thing you do have to be mindful of is fluoride. Like fluoride is not something that typically works its way into an MHP out of a primary material. So, so when you get into recycling, things like that, you got to be mindful of. Certainly when you're shredding, right? A, a charged battery or a partially charged battery has risks of fire. So anytime you're processing, there are various things you need to worry about. But from a health, safety, environmental perspective, I'm not aware of any issues of concern um, with our with our process. Um, that are that are particularly noteworthy. Otherwise, we would have we would have addressed it. So I may or may not be addressing that question head on. And if I've missed it, apologies. Feel free to reach out, and I'll uh, I'll address it more satisfactorily. Okay, great. Now, there's a couple of questions that are along a similar line. It's circling back to some things we discussed earlier. But uh, you know, there's one question about timing uh, and a countdown on the website indicating uh, yeah. the opening of of the plant yeah. to where we are now. And and another question about would there potentially be further cost overruns as well? What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on these things? You know, looking at timing and cost yeah. overruns, what are the risks of, of delays and or further cost overruns in some of these? Plans? I feel I feel quite quite good about the work we've done in the cobalt plant. Um, you know, virtually 100% detailed engineering. A lot of procurement now has been done. Um, you know, execution of that final contract, the big construction job. Um, I think we would probably try to do it on a target price or a fixed price basis. And so, you know, the idea is, I think we know what the costs are when it comes to lock in that contract, we'll know before we start, right, whether it's still accurate or not. So I feel good about that, that the recycling, as I mentioned, it's a desktop study, scoping study. So it's 8 million plus minus 50%. These things don't usually go minus 50, as we all know. So, the, so, so it can go up, but we're talking 8 million, not 80 million. And, and so, um, that's part of the objectives of this quarter, right, is to do more detailed engineering, uh, to do the medicine modeling, to do the equipment sizing, to understand the long lead equipment. So, um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if there was some flex in that black mass number, but by order of magnitude, um, you know, it's still it's still going to be an attractive uh, path forward and, and we'll, we'll get better guidance on that. Great. And perhaps one final question. Um... You know, obviously, you had mentioned in the presentation that you the recently announced Ford uh, plant uh, mm -hmm. or, or plans to build a, a battery materials plant. How would that impact you and and others in the market? Yeah, look, we had the Ford announcement last week, and then all over the press right now is this looming Northvolt funding announcement, where they just raised 1.2 billion. If you look at the investors, I think it was a debt round because uh, they're still private. Um, I think there were three, if not four, Canadian funds invested. So where is their battery plant going to go? Yeah, I got an idea. It was rumored to be South Shore, Montreal, but the fact that you got so many Canadian investors, I mean, I know them, but, but I could, I, I've got a pretty, again, not inside information, pretty good hunch based on what the press is saying that, that that's another plant coming to Canada. Frankly, and frankly, the Canada U.S. border doesn't really matter. I mean, it, it's fairly porous for purposes of our supply chain, but it's another proximate plant. You've got Umacore building a CAM and PCAM plant near Kingston. Um, all these players, what it has done, which is helpful, is created a greater sense of urgency of, around Electra and the partnership, partnership on cobalt, partnership on recycling, 
and even nickel. We got a couple of conversations on nickel, which seems so far down the line, and it is for me. It's probably five years down the line, um, and a billion dollars. So, so how we get there, but people need to figure that out, right? This is a massive global supply chain by companies that are hundreds of times larger than we are, and and, and so I think um, all these investments are creative to our strategy. Uh, and then you ask yourself, well, Trump, hold on a billion dollars. You guys are never going to do it. You might be right. right? We, we launched a, a process with BMO back in Q1 around strategic options. Um, how does Electra execute on everything we have? To me, it's all about creating, maximizing shareholder value and respecting stakeholder interests beyond just the shareholders. Um, if we're successful, I, you know, we're probably not around, right? There's, we get bought, we merge, whatever. And I think that that's not a terrible outcome. Right now, though, based on where we are, we've got to, you know, build the stock price back up, get ourselves to cash flow, build our partnerships, and and see how far we can push this. But but ultimately, the whole point of that BMO process was, I think, a, an acknowledgement or recognition by myself and the board and the management team that we can't do it alone. And and whether that means Canadian government or DOD or LG support or or a takeout, we don't know. But we just got to keep our eyes open for the right opportunities, not necessarily an off-ramp, but the right opportunities to make sure that A, we're successful and B, shareholders are rewarded for the, the risk they're taking. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to again thank Trent Mel from Electra for presenting today. And thank you everyone on the line for tuning in. Uh, just a reminder that Red Cloud Securities will be back next Tuesday afternoon when our webinar series continues with Enviro Gold Global presenting Tuesday, August 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody.